I'm in Joshua chapter 1 again. And I'm going to talk about the kind of person that God uses. There are men that God uses, but then there's men that won't allow God to use them. So the Lord isn't looking for talent or a high IQ or many degrees or good orators or flashiness or big words or anything that would draw attention to the man because if you got attention drawn to the man, that will many times take away the attention from the Almighty who is using the man. So Joshua, he is the kind of man that God uses. Joshua is going to display all the characteristics of someone who could be used to God. These things that Joshua displays didn't have anything to do with his size or his age or his talent. I mean, he was much smaller than his enemies. He was pretty old. And the thing about Joshua is that he is... He showed a life of being willing, very willing. And a man that God uses is willing to do some things. So let's look at some things Joshua was willing to do and see the man that God uses. So look at Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. In Joshua 1, 1 and 2, it says, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. So Joshua was willing to do some things. Joshua is a man willing to submit to authority. What kind of authority? Well, number one, his God. In verse one, it says, the Lord spake unto Joshua. The Lord knew that when he told Joshua to do something, that Joshua was going to do it. You have 66 letters you personally have 66 letters from the Almighty Himself. And when you open your sharp two-edged sword, your King James Bible, you could easily say, And the Lord spake to... Insert your name there. See, every time you open the Bible, the Lord's speaking to you. And He's got something for you. You see, God has all these things He's telling you to do, but is He your authority? Are you willing to submit to an authority? You know, why is an atheist an atheist? He doesn't want God as an authority. Why do some saints correct the Bible? They don't want God to be the final authority. Why do some saints act like atheists? Because they don't have an authority. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, Titus 1.16. But God is looking for a Bible believer that will submit to His authority. You know, before you do anything, you should think about what does God think about what I'm about to do? Does God want me to do this? And always be thinking about what God wants for your life. Are you a man that's willing to submit to an authority? And the first authority you want to submit to is God Almighty. You see, there's a lot of authority that you're going to have to submit to. But it's better to obey God rather than men. And Joshua was a guy that was always submitting to authority. So the Lord spake unto Joshua. And then number two, he submits to his father. It says, the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, N-U-N, the son of Nun. His father's name was Nun. And I'd say Nun was the happiest guy around because a wise son maketh a glad father. Proverbs 15, 20. Can you say that about yourself? Am I a wise son that's making a glad father? And if you're a good son that's serving God, reading the Bible, trying to do right, if your father's worth anything, he should be a glad father. Now, I know there's a lot of deadbeat dads out there that couldn't care less about what you're doing, and he doesn't realize the value of having a son that loves the Bible and loves God, so he's just not thinking about it one way or the other. But 
and you know, if you got a wise father, and if you're a wise son, then you're making your father glad for Proverbs 15, 20. And you think about this, your father is an authority. If you won't submit to the authority of your father as a kid growing up in his home, if you won't submit to an authority while you're young, do you think you'll submit to your heavenly father later on in life? In Ephesians 6 and verse 2, Ephesians 6, 2, it says, Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Verse 3, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Joshua lived a long time. He's pretty old right here in the book of Joshua. Honor thy father and mother, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. If you don't, if you won't submit to your heavenly father, or if you won't submit to your earthly father, you really think you're going to submit to your heavenly father? You know, my papa was like my father, and I knew the recliner was his chair. Just like you need to know the throne of your heart belongs to your heavenly father. And my papa was the man of the house. I knew I always asked him before I could do anything. Just like it should be with your heavenly father. And my grandfather would could just look at me and I'd straighten up. He didn't have to yell at me or do or nothing. He could just look at me a certain way and I would straighten up. Just like when my Bible's open in a room, you'll notice just one look at it from somebody and people just quit cussing. It's like daddy's in the room giving you the look when you got that Bible open. You see, you need to submit to God just like you would submit to your earthly father. Even more reverence. So Joshua's a man willing to submit to his God. He's willing to submit to his father and if you're not going to submit to your father, I doubt you're going to submit to God when you get older and out on your own. And number three, your pastor. The amazing thing about Joshua is that he followed Moses, the servant of the Lord, all those years. He was Moses' minister, and Joshua helped Moses and did whatever he needed. So would you be able to sit under a pastor... And let him have the rule over you, Hebrews thirteen seventeen. Would you give him double honor, First Timothy five seventeen, or do you need to be the head honcho all the time? You see, before God can really use you, you need to show that you can sit under a pastor. Can you submit to the authority of an earthly father? Can you submit to the authority of a pastor? Can you submit to the authority of a teacher? Or a supervisor. You know, you see a lot of people that go into the workplace and they talk down to the supervisor. They say, I'm not doing what he tells me to do. He's not my boss. But yeah, he is your boss. Can you submit to the, all these authorities? If a cop turns his lights on to pull you over, are you going to pull over? Will you roll down your window? Will he do what? Will you do what he tells you to do? Or are you going to be one of these people that says, no, I don't have to do that. I don't have to listen to you. You know, you need to submit to authority. And if you can't follow a man that's an authority figure in your life that you can see with your own two eyes how well you follow God that you can't see. If you can't love your pastor and father whom you can see, how can you love God? First John 4.20 in 1 John 4.20, it says, If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he's a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, how can he love God, whom he hath not seen? You know, if you can't submit to the authority of men on the earth that are authority figures, how are you going to submit to God? Well, Joshua is a man willing to follow an authority, and that's the kind of person that God uses. So you need to be examining your life and look at your life from 
the time you get up to the time you go to bed and think about all your authority figures and how are you treating that authority. Especially when it comes to God. Now there'll be a time when rebellion becomes godly because when the men and the, the authority figures in your life tell you to do something against God, then you go against them and you go God's way. But Joshua, Joshua's the son of none. He was willing to follow his father. Joshua was Moses' minister. He was able to sit under Moses. And the Lord spake unto Joshua. And Joshua did what he says. He's willing to follow that authority. Joshua is a man willing to face his enemies. In Joshua 1, go back to Joshua 1. Joshua 1, 2 says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Joshua is a man willing to face his enemies. And many enemies... The Lord told Joshua to go over this Jordan. Joshua was going to lead the people into the promised land. This doesn't mean the battle is over. The book of Joshua is battle after battle that all pictures the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Joshua is going to face many enemies. In Joshua 12, 7 through 24, it'll give you a rundown of the kings and the armies that he faces. But Joshua was a man of war who was willing to face many enemies. He's willing to go over this Jordan and face some of the meanest, toughest people on the planet. And you see him as a picture of Jesus Christ back there when he fought with the Amalekites back there in Exodus 17. They were a picture of the flesh, and you can't overcome the flesh without the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you willing to take on many enemies? If God is going to use you, you have to be ready. All that live godly in Christ Jesus are going to suffer persecution, 2 Timothy 3.12. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16.9 that there are many adversaries. You know, sometimes it's going to seem like the enemies of hell are attacking you on every side. Because you'll, you'll get home. Maybe your family's going crazy on you. You go to work. Seems like they're going crazy. Maybe even at church, on the internet. You know, we live in a world where people are constantly on the internet. Maybe you got people on there saying all kinds of stuff about you and towards you. Maybe even in the newspaper. You got somebody somewhere trying to cause you trouble being a thorn in the flesh. Because you are trying to do what God wants you to do. But you got to walk circumspectly, checking every corner, Ephesians 5.15. Walking circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. You got to be a man that's willing to face your enemies, not giving up just because somebody said something about you or because somebody's tormenting you because you're a Christian. And the Lord told Joshua, there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of his life. And God has already shown us the defeat of our enemies. You know, think about all the enemies that are defeated that you don't have to face because of the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, 26, it says the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. The Lord has defeated death. In 1 Corinthians 15, 50, 
4, it says, So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be unto God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. He's already defeated death. In Hebrews 2.14, it shows you what he's done to the devil. It says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. And our flesh even. In Romans 8.23 it says, not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. We're going to have the victory over all these things. One of these days at the rapture, you're going to get a new body. You're leaving the flesh behind. One of these days, the devil's going to be thrown into the bottomless pit and then later on into the lake of fire. One of these days, there's going to be no more death. Those are your enemies. And the Lord Jesus Christ has defeated them. You know, when, when the Lord Jesus Christ was here, he never sinned one time. He knew no sin. He did no sin. Neither was God found in his mouth. He's the spotless Lamb of God. He defeated sin. And through him, each little sin that comes in your mind or that you're tempted with, you can turn it over to him and have victory over that sin. You got to be willing to face the enemies. The Lord Jesus Christ has already faced all the enemies that you're going to face and defeated them, and he lives in you. So he's, he's got the experience. He's got the power. So... There are many enemies. There are many adversaries. And then there's giant enemies as well. Joshua didn't just have many enemies. There were going to be giant enemies. And remember back there when they sent the spies into the land of the giants and Israel chickened out? Well, Joshua didn't. If you remember, Joshua and Caleb are the only remaining of Israel from that day because they... Holy followed the Lord, Numbers 32, 12. And Joshua was ready to face the giant enemy. Sometimes a giant running upon you, like Job 16, 14 talks about. One giant running on you can be more intimidating than a lot of little enemies surrounding you. And there are a lot of persecutions and temptations and shortcomings that are constantly every day hitting you on every side. And for the most part, you... Press right on through all these things that are smacking you in the face around every corner. But then here comes that giant that almost knocks you off the horse. You know, that's just one enemy. But he's so big and intimidating that he's more scary than all the little enemies surrounding you. But you know why Joshua isn't afraid of giant enemies? Because he has a really big father. And I'm not talking about None. I'm not talking about his earthly father. I'm talking about his heavenly father that told him, there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. He said, there shall not any man be able to stand before thee. That includes any giant. You see, you've got, you've got the same father that Joshua has. You've got the same God. You're in a royal line of soldiers. The man of war, which is the Lord, Exodus 15.3, lives inside you, Colossians 1.27. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And every giant down here is under his feet, Ephesians 1.22. But you got to be a person that's willing to face enemies because you're going to have many enemies, 
Marvel not if the world hates you. You know that it hated him before it hated you. You got to be a man willing to follow authority. A man willing to face enemies. A man willing to focus on scripture. And Joshua chapter 1. Go back to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua 1 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. So he's a man willing to follow willing to focus on the scriptures. And that's all the scripture. He told Joshua to observe to do according to all that is written therein. Now can you imagine Joshua's IQ in regard to Genesis through Deuteronomy? Not, not only did he know the holy man of God who pinned it down, Moses, he was the servant of, of the God that inspired it. Joshua was the servant of the God that inspired what Moses wrote down. And then he even lived through the major portion of it. He even saw the plague back in Exodus. You see, he lived and breathed the scriptures. I mean, that's a lot of <clears throat> hands-on experience with it. He knew the person that pinned it down. He knew the God that inspired it, and then he even lived through a major portion of it. He lived through Exodus. He lived through Numbers. He lived through Deuteronomy. And you see, if you're going to be a man that God uses, then you're going to be a man of the Scriptures. You need to read it. 1 Timothy 4.13. And 1 Timothy 4 and verse 13, it says, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. In 2 Timothy 2.15, it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You memorize it. Psalm 119.11, you got to hide it in your heart. This way you can do all that is written therein. You can't do all that's written therein if you don't even read it. You need to do all that's written therein, rightly divided. And you see, you have more work cut out for you than Joshua. You see, you've got more books of the Bible. You've got more to rightly divide. You may not have lived the events of Scripture like Joshua and got to see it right before your own, your own eyes necessarily, but you need to make best friends with the Bible. You need to make best friends with the Bible characters and envision yourself in their shoes because it's all for your learning and admonition. You know, you think that those Old Testament stories, a lot of you think that it's outdated. I, I, I can't tell you how many times, literally people many times, even Christians, I'll see I'm reading in the Old Testament or even I'm reading Revelation or something. They'll be like, why are you reading that for? You're reading Leviticus? You're reading Deuteronomy? Well, Romans 15, 4 says, For whatsoever things are written aforetime are written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. That's why I'm reading Joshua. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says, Now all these things happened unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. These things are to give us encouragement, give us examples, illustrations. You see, it takes a willing man to dive into all the counsel of God, as referred to in Acts 20, 27. You're going to have to be willing to put hobbies and the cares of this life aside to get into all the scriptures. It's going to take a long time. So, Josh was a man willing to focus on scripture. All the scripture. Number two, all the time. The Lord told him, Thou shalt meditate therein day and night in Joshua 1 8. Joshua would have, would have been in those scriptures off and on from the evening to the morning and morning to the evening. His delight would have been in the law of, of the Lord. 
Psalm 1, 2. And you know how Paul says to pray without ceasing in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17? Well, you can also focus on the scriptures without ceasing. There is always a way to incorporate the scriptures in everything you're doing. Put a New Testament in your pocket. Put a Bible in your lunchbox. Put scriptures on index cards in your back pocket. Take, tape some scripture on the wall. And you can spend 15 to 20 hours a day meditating on it in the background. And you see, the righteous are bold as a lion, Proverbs 28, 1. The scriptures will make you bold as a lion. No wonder Joshua was so bold. He was pumped full of the word. And in four times in Joshua 1, it says, Be strong and of good courage. In verse 6, in verse 7, 9, and 18. And this can be accomplished when you have Scripture because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, Romans ten seventeen. That's where the courage is drawn from. Be strong and have a good courage. He says it over and over again in this chapter. You've got to be a man willing to focus on the Scriptures. You've got to be a man willing to face the enemy, a man willing to follow an authority. You've got to be a man willing to fight for brethren. Look at Joshua 1.11. In Joshua 1.11, it says, he's looking at these uh, two and a half tribes, and he says in Joshua 1.11, Pass through the hosts and command the people, saying, Prepare you victuals, for within three days you shall pass over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God giveth you to possess it. And to the Reubenites, and to the Gadites, and to the half-tribe of Manasseh spake Joshua, saying, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God hath given you rest, and hath given you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your cattle shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side Jordan. But ye shall pass before your brethren armed, all the mighty men of valor, and help them. And to the Lord have given your brethren rest, as he hath given you. And they also have possessed the land which the Lord your God giveth them. Then you shall return unto the land of your possession, and enjoy it, which Moses the Lord's servant gave you on this side Jordan, toward the sun rising. And they answered Joshua, saying, All that thou commandest us we will do, and whithersoever thou sendest us we will go. So, the Reubenites... And the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh weren't possessing the land on the other side of the Jordan. They had already got the land they wanted on the wrong side of Jordan. But Joshua wants them to also go over and help their brethren fight and possess the land. Are you somebody that's willing to fight for brethren? Something you don't may not realize is that life should be about God and should be about other people. Are you willing to fight for brethren? Are you a man that's willing to weep with them that weep? Imagine the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe Manasseh being willing to go over and fight to help their brethren. Joshua told them, Your wives, your little ones, and your cattle shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side Jordan. So they had to leave their wives. They had to leave their children and their cattle behind to fight the battles. They could have hung back and enjoyed their land and their wives and their kids, but they chose to help bear burdens, Galatians 6, 2, and weep with those that weep, Romans twelve fifteen. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. They chose to fight alongside their brethren and be by their side. And God can easily Use a man who sees the brethren like he sees his own body, his own family, and will stick out his neck for the saints. Romans sixteen four, Paul talks about some people that stuck their neck out for him. See, a man that God uses realizes the things that matter are the eternal things. And the eternal things are God, the souls of people, and the scriptures. That's what Joshua's focus was on. God, people, and the scriptures. Not just lost people. It's not just, you know, you hear a lot about lost souls. 
But another focus should be the souls of your fellow Christians. See, if you're a pastor, a teacher, evangelist, somebody like that, then God is wanting you to perfect the saints and edify the body of Christ, Ephesians 4.12. Maybe you have things settled and you are where you need to be with God. Now it's time to help the brethren get there. Help them fight the battle of learning the scriptures, getting a handle on the scriptures. You got to weep with those that weep, but number two, you got to rejoice when they rejoice. Joshua tells them that when the Lord hath given rest to the brethren, then the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh can go in and enjoy their land. You see, when those two and a half tribes help the brethren get possession of all their land, then they can come back over the Jordan and get possession of their land and, and enjoy it. He says, enjoy their land. They could then rejoice with them that do rejoice. And the Lord gave us, us richly all things to enjoy. How much more could you enjoy the things of God while you know your close brethren are also enjoying it? You know, a Diotrephes who loved to have the preeminence wouldn't rejoice when his brethren rejoices. He only wants good things to happen to him. And how can God use a person like that? See, when your brethren have victory, you also have victory because you're members of the same body. So let me ask you this. Do you want to be used of God? Are you the kind of person that God can use? Are you someone willing to follow authority, someone willing to focus on Scripture, someone willing to fight for brethren, someone willing to face many enemies? You may have excuses about how you look. There's some people out there you got excuses about about why you won't do nothing because of how you look. But the Lord Jesus Christ, when he came down in the flesh, he didn't um he didn't have any beauty that we should desire him, it says in Isaiah 53, 2. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. When he came down the flesh, he didn't have beauty that we should desire him. You may have excuses about how you speak, like Moses in Exodus 14. You may have excuses about how little you know. You may think, well, I don't know enough to do something for God. Well, you just try to serve God anyway, and then you learn some stuff on the on the journey. You know, God had, in 1 Corinthians one twenty seven, God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise anyway, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And I've made all these excuses. You know, I'm a quiet, shy type of guy. I failed ninth grade three times. You see, but God doesn't need all these things that you think he needs. He just needs someone who's willing to be used. He wants someone willing to say, send me, just like Isaiah. Lord, here am I, send me, Isaiah 6, 8. If you're not going to be used of God, then you're going to be used by the devil. If you aren't going to yield yourselves unto God, you will yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness, Romans 6, 13. So what you need to do is take the step of faith and say, I'll do it and use me. Then keep pressing on and God can begin to work through you. And all those weaknesses you have, that's only going to allow God to get more glory. Because maybe you aren't nice to look at. Okay, then people's going to focus on what's coming out of your mouth more. Maybe you don't know much. Well, just like with Peter, you know, he, they saw he they were unlearned and ignorant men, but they could tell that they had been with Jesus. You see, the the worse off you are while you're serving God, the more attention that God's going to get. So your weaknesses are God's advantage. The weaker you are, the more people can see the power of God when you submit to God. 
But this has been Joshua chapter 1 on the kind of person that God uses. And we'll pick up with Joshua 2 next time.